We will now look at our first big application formulated in terms of matrices, namely systems of linear equations, and we look at very simple linear systems that have an easy solution. So what do we mean by a system of linear equations? We start with a number of unknowns, x1, x2 through xn, and each of our equations is going to look like a constant times x1 plus a constant times x2 plus a constant times xn equal to a constant. The constants are going to be scalars in our field of scalars f, and we are going to look for solutions of such systems. What I notice when I look at this uh, set of expressions is that I can rewrite these in terms of matrices. If I pull out the coefficients from my equations and put them into a matrix, let's call it A, so the first row of A are the coefficients of my first equation, the second row of A, the coefficients of my second equations, and so forth, and pull the Bs into a vector by itself, and pull the Xs, all the unknowns, into a vector, then by the definition of multiplication of matrices, I see that my system can be rewritten as AX equal to B. Let's look at a few examples of such systems. Very first equation that I might write down is a system with just one equation and one unknown, 3X equals 5. If I translate that into matrix form, well, there's only a single coefficient, so my matrix A is going to be the matrix with just the number 3 in it. The X vector has only a single variable, so times x, and the right-hand side only has a single entry, so it looks like the matrix with entry 3 times the vector of unknowns with entry x is equal to a constant vector 5. If I look at the system of two equations in one unknown, I only have x's here. When I pull out the constants, I see my A matrix as the constants 3 and 6, the vector of unknowns, just the vectors x, and the right-hand side is the vector of the constants uh, 5 and 10. A little more interesting might be a system like this. 3x plus 2y minus z equals 4, and 6x minus 5y equals 10. Now I have a system of two equations in three unknowns. And when I pull out the coefficients, notice that the z is missing. That means that I have a plus 0z that is in here, and when I write my matrix of coefficients, I'll have to take account of that. So the x's are multiplied by 3, 6, the y's are multiplied by 2 and minus 5, and the z's are multiplied by minus 1 and 0. My vector of unknowns this time is x, y, and z, and the right-hand side is 4, 10. So I've got an example of three systems with different numbers of equations and unknowns, and the corresponding matrix representation. The next system here, 3x plus 2y minus z equals 5, well, that first equation looks fine, but 6 times sine x plus y equals 10, that sine x is not just x, it's a function of x, and that makes this a nonlinear system. So this system here, I cannot write in the form AX equals B. We are not going to treat systems that are nonlinear. Now, one thing about partitioning, if you remember, if I take my matrix here and I focus on the rows, so I'm going to put the partition line in, then I see the first equation, the first dot product, 3, 2, minus 1 times X, Y, Z equals 4, I see it as my original equation. And the second dot product, 6x minus 5y plus 0z equals 10, I see as my second equation. So when I focus on the rows of the matrix A, I recover my linear system, planes in 3D, and we will call this the row view of the system. If instead I look at the columns of that matrix, I see that x is multiplying the first column, the x always hits the 3 and the 6 when I do my dot products. Uh, I see the x times the first column of the matrix, plus y times the second column of the matrix, plus z times the third column of that matrix, equal to 4, 10. So I see the linear combination of the columns of A with arbitrary values x, y, and z that should be chosen so as to add up to the right-hand side. We will call this the column view of the system. 
So just by looking at the row view or the column view, I recover my original system of equations, my hyperplanes, or my linear combination of vectors if I look at the columns instead. Now we want to talk about what it means to have a solution for the system of linear equations. The definition is that if I take a linear system ax equals b, if I find an assignment of values to the variables in x in that unknown vector, so that that product indeed multiplies out to b, then I'm going to call that assignment of values to x a solution of that system. All of the equations are going to be simultaneously set. Let's look at three particular examples. So I've got a first uh, example, C1, and C1 is a system of two equations in two unknowns, x and y. And uh, the solution, therefore, is any x and any y that I can plug in that satisfies both the first equation and the second equation. So if I look at a plot of these, the first equation is just a line, namely the blue line over here in my plot. Any x and y value on that blue line satisfies the first equation. The second equation, 2x minus 3y equals minus 4, can be represented by the red line. So any x and y value on the red line satisfies the second equation. At the intersection of those two lines, that particular x and y value happens to be 1 and 2. Uh, that particular value satisfies both equations and therefore is a solution of my system. I have exactly one solution for this first problem. Let's now look at the second problem. Again, I have two equations in two unknowns, and again, uh, they are lines. But I obfuscated the second line a little bit. The second line, if you look at it, is actually just two times the first line. So it's really the same line repeated twice. And when I try and graph that, both of these lines are superposed. And as a consequence, any x and y value on this line satisfies both equations and is therefore a solution of my system. I have an infinite number of solutions in this particular case. And I'll go back to my third system. My third system is 3x plus 2y equals 7, 6x plus 4y equals 5. But when you look, if I notice that 3x plus 2y, I multiply that by 2, I get 6x plus 4y. To get the same equation, therefore, I would have to have 2 times 7 is 14. I don't have 14, I have 5 over here. So my two lines, my first line in blue, is right here at the same place as before. But my second line, the L2 line, is parallel to the L1 line. They don't have an intersection. There is no x and y value in common. There is no solution to this system. So we have three cases uh, that we just saw. We have seen a unique solution for our system, an infinite number of solutions for our system, and no solution for our system. This will turn out to be the general case. If we take a system AX equals B, we will always have no solution at all, or a unique solution, exactly one solution. Or if there's more than exactly one solution, then we'll have an infinite number of solutions. There's nothing in between. Since we can have more than one solution, we therefore need to talk about a set of solutions for the linear system. Now, let's try and solve an AX equals B system, but let's go slowly. Let's take some easy cases. The first example is a system of two equations in two unknowns, X plus three Y equals five, two Y equals two. And what I can notice is that the, the second equation only has the variable Y in it. So I can solve the second equation for Y. I immediately obtain that Y is equal to one. Now that I know Y, I can plug it into the first equation. I get that x is equal to 2. It's very easy to solve this system from the bottom up. And we'll use the word backwards for it. Start with the last equation and work up to the first equation. The result of this particular system is that we found exactly one solution, one xy pair that solves the system. We have a unique solution for that system. xy is equal to 2, 1.
let me make my system a little bit bigger. This time I have three equations in three unknowns, x, y, and z. But if I look at that system, the last equation again only has z in it. So I immediately can solve for z. z is 16 divided by 4, that's 4. Now that I know z, the next to last equation, once I plug that z value in, only has the y variable. So I can solve for the y variable next. Now I know both z and y. So when I go to the previous equation here, now I can plug in for z and for y, and I only have a single unknown x in this equation, and I can solve for x. It's again easy to solve this system from the bottom up, backwards. Namely, we start at the last equation, 4 z equals 16, and get z equals 4. We substitute z equals 4 into the previous equation, so 2y minus z when z is equal to 4 becomes y is equal to 3. And notice how I'm doing this. I'm taking that z part and I'm pushing it over to the other side. So now I have 2 plus z. 2y is equal to 2 plus z. I will have to divide out that coefficient 2. So 1 divided by 2 times the right-hand side 2 and the z part coming over plus uh, the z value z equals 4 is equal to 3. Now I know y and z. So now I can try and solve for the first equation, for the x in the first equation. x plus 3y minus z equals 6. Push the y and z's over to the other side. That gives me x is equal to 6 minus 3y plus z. And coefficient out front was 1, so I don't have to divide out that coefficient. And I get x is equal to 1. Rewriting this in vector form, we again have a unique solution. x, y, and z is equal to 1, 3, and 4. Uh, be a little careful when you work backwards. The x solution is what we obtained last. The y solution was obtained just before that, and the z solution was obtained at the very beginning. So don't mistakenly write the vector as 4, 3, 1, when in fact it is 1, 3, 4. That you want. So what makes all this work? Let's look at the system again, especially let's look at the last system. I have a first equation, it starts with an x, and then I don't have any x's anymore. So if I want to solve for x, I have to use the first equation. Okay, so now I have the x's. If I look at the next, the remaining equations, I ha don't have any x's anymore. So now my first variable here is y, and there are no y variables in the system anymore. So my second equation has to be solved for y. And finally, the last equation that's left over is the z equation. That is the one that I'm going to have to solve for c. What makes it click is that each one of the equations, the first equation has an x, the next equations no longer have an x in it. The next equation has a y. And after that, the equations below no longer have y's in them. The next equation has a z. So if I had a bigger system, the equations below no longer should have a z in them. As long as the equations look like that, have that pattern to them, I'm going to be able to solve backwards. So this pattern then uh, is that as long as we have an equation for each of the variables, a system that satisfies that pattern where the first equation is the only one with an x, after that, the remaining equations, the new first equation after get rid of the equation with the x, is the only one with a y. The new first equation after that, once I decide that that's the equation I use for a y, uh, is the only one with a z. Now, that begs one question. What if I don't have an equation for each of the variables? So let's look at a simple example for that one. A system with three variables, but only one equation. Okay, so x plus 2y minus z is equal to 1. If you think about solving that for x, well, yeah, I can write x as uh, 1 minus 2y plus z. But I don't have any constraints for y and z. Whatever y and z I want to plug in here, I'll be able to solve for a corresponding x. So what we are going to do is when I don't have a, an equation for the y, I'm going to assign a parameter to y so that I can write y is equal to something. I call it alpha. Similarly, I don't have an equation for the z. 
I'll assign a parameter to z. Doesn't have to be the same as the uh, same choices I made for the y, so I'll give it a different name. I'll call it beta. I'm going to set y equals alpha, z equals beta, and then when I solve for the x that I get at that point, I'm plugging in the y value and the z value, I get 1 minus 2 alpha plus beta. So now I've written down a solution in terms of some parameters, alpha and beta, that I'm going to have to pick. And whatever I pick, I will indeed have a solution. And again, by convention, we are going to write the solution in vector notation. And what we see then is that x is equal to 1 minus 2 alpha plus beta. y is equal to, well, I'll read that as 0 plus 1 times alpha plus 0 times beta. And z is 0 plus 0 times alpha plus 1 times beta. Therefore, my solution vector x, y, z is going to have a constant and a term multiplying alpha and a term multiplying beta. So for my x equation, I have x is equal to 1 minus 2 alpha plus 1 times beta. For my y variable, I'm going to have 0 plus 1 alpha plus 0 beta. For the z variable, I have 0 plus 0 alpha plus 1 beta. So now I've written it in vector form. We will call this vector form the standard form of the solution. We'll always write solutions in that form. And uh, the original equation, if you think about the equation here, x plus 2y minus z equals 1, that's a plane, right? A plane in three directions. It has a normal vector, 1, 2, minus 1. So a plane through the origin. And the solution that we found when we wrote it in that form is we write it as a linear combination of two vectors in the plane. And we're pushing it away from the origin by this vector 1, 0, 0. So the solution indeed is a plane pushed away from the origin by 1, 0, 0, so that we indeed can get that value 1 out of it. The next set of remarks is that I could have chosen to rewrite my equations differently. I could have interchanged the variables. For example, I could have written it as minus z plus x plus 2y equals 1 and said I'm going to use this equation to solve for z. And that means I don't have an x, I don't have a y, no constraint for those, so I'll set x equals alpha, y equals beta, and when I solve for z and then plug everything together, this is the solution that I get. It really is the same plane. I think the same system has to represent the same solution, the same plane in 3D. It's just that the representation of that plane is different. One thing you might notice is that the number of variables for which we don't have constraints doesn't change. I had two variables, uh, the, x, the y variable and the z variable, that we didn't have a constraint for, that I couldn't solve for, and so I had to give them parameters. Well, over here I've changed it around. This time it's the x and y variables that I don't have a constraint for that I have to give parameters to, but it's, again, two parameters. So in both cases I have two parameters, I have a plane sitting here, pushed away from the origin by the appropriate vector. How many solutions? This time we found an infinite number of solutions. One for any alpha and any beta that I care to plug into my solution. Let's look at the second example. So this time I have four variables, x1, x2, x3, and x4, and two equations. So, almost the right form, right? I have an equation that has the first unknown and no x1s in the equation underneath, the next equation in x2, and so I have no constraint for x3 and x4. The second equation I'll use to solve for x2, the first equation I'll uh, solve for x1, and x3 and x4 are free to, I'm free to choose any which way I care to. So I'm going to set x3 and x4 equal to parameters again, just as I did before. So this time it looks like this. I have x3 is equal to alpha, x4 is equal to beta, and alpha and beta are whatever values I happen to choose for x3 and x4. 
And again, I can solve this backwards. Now that I have x3 and x4 as alpha and beta, x2 becomes minus 1 times 1 minus x3 minus 2x4, and it adds up to minus 1 plus alpha plus 2 beta. And now that I have x3, x4, and x2, I can solve my first equation for x1, and I get 1 half plus 3 half beta when I plug that together. And I now get to rewrite it in standard form. And so this is what I end up, that the vector of unknowns is equal to a constant vector plus alpha times a vector plus beta times another vector. Now look at the system again. If I were to rearrange the equation, say I make x3 the leading variable here, so I'll have minus 2x1 minus x3 plus x2 plus x4 and x3 minus x2 plus 2x4. I again have a system in just the right form, then I could solve for my leading variables, but now I'd get a slightly different form of the solutions again. I'd like you to try it. What does the standard form look like if I make, say, x3 the leading variable in the second equation? If I reorder my variables as x1, x3, x2, x4. So let's formalize what we've just done. Uh, we'll give this uh, method a name. We'll call it the back substitution algorithm. So for my first example, to make it uh, a little clearer, here is a system of equations with four variables rewritten in matrix form. And if I look at the leading variables, there's a leading variable x1, a leading variable x2, and a leading variable x4. There is no equation dedicated to solve for x3. x3 is a free variable. You have to recognize these simple systems when they are in matrix form. And if you look, the leading entry in any one row is to the right of the leading entry in any row above it. If I happen to have a row of zeros, there's no leading entry anymore. Any row of zeros will have to put at the bottom of that matrix. So if you have a matrix like that, we will say that that matrix is in row echelon form. Then instead of numbers multiplying the basic variable, the leading entry, we introduce another word, we'll call these numbers pivots. So minus two is a pivot for the first row, minus one, the first non-zero entry in the second row, is a pivot in the second row, similar to the four is a pivot in the third row. The row that has a pivot in it, if I want to talk about such a row, I'll call it the pivot row. Or if I want to refer to the corresponding column, I'll call that the pivot column. Then variables that don't have pivots, I can't solve for it. I don't have any dedicated equation for it. Those are the ones I'm setting equal to alpha, beta, gamma, etc. They're called the free variables. Variables that do have pivots, that's the ones I solve for, we'll call the basic variable. So, here are two examples of matrices. If I look at the first matrix, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from left to right until I hit a non-zero number, and I'll put a vertical bar in. I start in the first row, I go all the way to five. In the second row, I'll go all the way to eight. In the next row, I'll go all the way to three. And in the next row, well, there's no non-zero number, I go all the way to the end but then connect up those vertical bars, what I see is a staircase. In fact, that's what echelon form really means, a staircase form. Uh, so this matrix here is in row echelon form. I see a staircase pattern for my pivots. If instead I look at this matrix over here, I go to the first non-zero entry. So I'll see the five, I'll put this vertical bar in, in the second row, I see the 8, vertical bar in front of the 8, vertical bar in front of the 2 in the next row. When I now connect those vertical bars, I no longer have a staircase. This matrix is not in row echelon. The next observation that I want is when I look at that system AX equals B, I'll typically do the following. I'll take that matrix A and I'll append the B vector right at the end of the matrix. Uh, so I introduce a new column in that matrix. This new matrix, A augmented with B, is called the augmented form of a system. Think about it as follows. Uh, matrix multiplication of AX equals B 
I have an A matrix multiplied by an X vector giving me this right hand side. Since the X vector, the names of the variables aren't too important, just the first one, second one, third one, if I call them X1, X2, X3, X4, or if I call them X, Y, Z, W, it doesn't really matter. What matters are those numbers. So in my matrix multiplication, it's A followed by B. And if I combine these two matrices into a single matrix, that's the augmented form. So we'll have a notation convention for our augmented form for hand computations. We'll take the matrix A and augment it with the B vector. So here is my matrix A, augmented with the B vector. And I'll put in some decorations to make sure I don't mess up my computation. So that vertical bar separates out the A matrix from the right hand side, from B. So here's my augmented form. Next, I'm going to look at the pivots. And here it's minus two and minus one. And I'll show myself that staircase. I'll show myself the fact that the matrix is indeed in row echelon form. And then everywhere I see a pivot, those are the basic variables. I typically, personally, I write an arrow with a double line and write the names of the variables underneath so that I can read it off easily. And then the remaining variables, the ones that don't have a pivot in their column, those are the free variables. That's the one that we set equal to constants, so single line to indicate free variable, x3 equals the first parameter, the next free variable, x4, is the second parameter. So if I want to make sure I don't uh, make mistakes, this is how I'll decorate my matrices. Now the algorithm that goes with that, that unravels from the bottom up, is called the back substitution algorithm. And what we have to have for it to work is we have to have a matrix in row echelon form. So we'll assign different parameters to each of the three variables, if you have any. Here it's x3 and x4 that got parameters associated with them. And then we'll just transcribe the system into the actual row view, into the equations, and so working backwards. Well, I'm actually not going to transcribe. I'll simply learn to read it right out of the matrix. It's easy enough. And I do that for speed. So just to uh, finish this example off, to see how this is done, here's my system, right? I've decorated it with my row echelon form outline. I've given names to the basic variables, x1 and x3. I've assigned parameters for the free variables, x2 and x4. And so my steps are, first of all, making sure that the system is in row echelon form, assign parameters to each of the three variables, all the va uh, variables that don't have a pivot associated with them get set equal to a parameter. And we'll transcribe the equation and solve from the bottom up. And finally, solve each equation in turn. Uh, let's see, I have my three variables already assigned. x2 equals alpha, x4 equals beta. Now I'm solving for the x equation from the bottom up that actually has numbers in it. That row of zeros doesn't have to. It just reads 0x1 plus 0x2 plus 0x3 plus 0x4 equals 0. It reads 0 equals 0. So the next equation that actually means something is here, this one. 2x3 plus x4 equals minus 1. So if I solve for that, that's going to be x3 is equal to, I'm going to have to divide out the uh, two. So x3 is equal to one half times, right hand side is minus one. And then this guy comes over to the other side that plus x4 goes over to the other side as minus one times x4. So x3 is one half times minus one, minus one times x4. And now plugging in alpha, my alpha and beta values, I get that x3 is minus a half, minus a half beta. Okay, done with this equation. Now we go to the previous equation. Here, this one. x1 plus 2x2 plus x3 plus x4 equals 5. They get shifted over. So it's x1 is equal to 5 minus 2x2 minus x3 minus x4. So x1 is equal to 5 minus 2x2 minus x3 minus x4. And plugging everything together, we now get an x1 solution from our system. And now that we have finished back substitution, we put everything together in standard form. I have four variables. I have x1, x2, x3, x4, a constant vector, constant number, 
plus alpha times something plus beta times something. So let's read them off. x1 is a constant 11 over 2. I pulled the one half out to make it easy. Minus 2 alpha. Again, there will be a one half that I chose to pull out. And finally, a minus one half times beta. Uh, so I filled in the x1 equation. Then the x2 equation is alpha. So zero plus one alpha plus zero beta. Zero plus one half over two is one alpha plus zero beta. Uh, for the x3 equation, similarly, it was minus a half minus a half beta. So minus a half zero alpha minus a half beta. And finally, the same for x my standard form of the solution. If I think about the geometric representation uh, of this, alpha times a vector plus beta times a vector, that's a hyperplane. And so what we're doing to this hyperplane that goes through the origin is we're pushing it away from the origin by some constant vector. And in terms of what we can plug in, any alpha I plug in here, any beta I plug in here is going to be a solution. In particular, if I plug in alpha equals zero, beta equals zero, that's going to eliminate those two vectors over here. That's going to just leave me the constant vector. So that constant vector is a solution. If I plug into my A x equals B system, I plug in uh, x1 is equal to 11 over 2, x2 is zero, x3 is minus a half, x4 is zero, it has to add up to the right-hand side. We'll see later that the other two vectors, the vector that multiplies alpha and the vector that multiplies beta, they also have to solve the system. They have to solve the system A x equals zero. So if I want to verify these vectors, if I'm telling you about the check immediately, is I take this vector, I'll substitute in my system, and I expect to see zeros as the right-hand side. Now the other remark here is that the form of that solution, of course, is not unique. For example, if I choose to pull a 1 out of the alpha, so if I rewrite alpha as 1 plus alpha tilde, I can do that for any alpha. And similarly, I'll pull out an alpha tilde from beta and rewrite beta as this constant alpha tilde plus a new beta tilde. I plug that into my solution here and recompute. This is what the solution looks like now a constant vector plus a parameter alpha tilde times a constant vector plus a parameter beta tilde times a constant vector. It looks different, but it's the same hyperplane pushed away from the origin the same way. It's the same set of solutions. Again, an infinite number of solutions here. Now, checking the, the system, the constant vector must satisfy Ax equals b. Each one of the vectors multiplying a parameter in turn separately, they turn out to satisfy Ax equals. So the takeaway for today are a couple of important concepts. The augmented matrix, the row echelon form of a matrix, pivots, basic and free variables. And once we have a system in row echelon form, it's easy to solve. All we have to do is solve backwards. And the geometric representation that the solution that we found is actually a hyperplane that's pushed away from the origin by a constant.